Welcome back to the Strategy Show. We are here today with Erika Klesdorfer, a leadership expert, executive coach, and management consultant. She is also part of the Global Educator Network of Duke University and a fellow of the Oxford Leadership Academy. Her recent assignments include BASF, Telefonica, and Akzo Nobel. Erika, thank you for being here. Pleasure. What are you currently creating and why? Well, as you know, we are usually creating a couple of things at the same time, and I am working on different things. One, I think that really excites me, it's our work with Oxford Leadership, as you said, and we're currently putting together an international team that is focusing on leadership 4.0 and also the digital possibilities of turning content into other forms of uh, development tools. So this is something that excites me. What is 4.0? Uh... Leadership 4.0. Well, it means it for me, it includes all the technical development. So it's not just content, but also how can you use actually the uh, tools that are now there's available to blend it in into content. I mean, I don't know, 20 years ago, I used to work at IBM. And back then we already talked about blended learning and we did a lot of blended learning um, management uh, sessions. But this, I would say, is the next level. It's really using even more technology to disrupt also in a very positive sense and to um, support managers on their individual but also organizational journey. What was missing in 3.0? <laughs> uh, I think nothing was missing because it didn't exist back then. Now technology has evolved. So I think it's just the usage of what's currently available. What do you stand for and what do you not stand for? Well, I ask also my clients to compare my self-perception and what definitely came back and what is true is I stand for clarity, straight talk and also quality. So for me, it's important to really talk about what's beneath the surface. So I'm not good as, at polishing the surface. I'm really a person who wants to dig deeper, who wants to make a difference because it, it, it doesn't make sense if we just continue with what is already there if it's not working. How would the two people you influenced most describe you and your impact on them? I don't know who are the two people. Uh, I guess that I've influenced a lot of people. Uh, in the past, I, I counted recently and I think I had the pleasure, I have to say, to work with probably 15,000 people, managers, throughout the world in the past 20 years. So I don't know who my influence the most. What I see nowadays is, uh, and this is what I really enjoy about my job, is I work, I teach, for example, at the Technical University or, or the University for Business Administration, and I work with executives. And for me, it's the diversity of the people I can work with and I can maybe inspire and and empower um, and I get some I I mean their clients you know I they attended sessions uh, or I worked with them 10 15 years ago and they still send me Christmas cards with content where they tell me what happened throughout the year and also what of the things they learned 10 years ago is still influencing their behavior and this is very touching. And how do they describe the impact you had? Different probably on one side it's that that I really helped them to to become clearer about their own strength and the impact and difference they can make but also to encourage them to stay true to themselves. So it's not about you know very often we we think we have to act, especially managers, in a specific way to be part of the successful club. And they're losing their own strength and power. So my goal is always to bring them back home to who they truly are. So to kind of come back uh, or experience once again their own unique strength and then act out of that unique strength. So when someone decides for your offerings, what do they really by what is it that they get that is not the product or the service but i would say they get change and transformation 
And it's very often an internal change, whether it's uh, if I do an individual coaching, if I work with teams or organizations, but it has to do with identifying where we stand, where we want to go and then move into that direction. And the only way to move together is that the peop that the team works really well with each other. And this is where I very often see issues so that people have conflicts, then power game starts. And the idea really is to make them talk to each other again. Basic sometimes, but you know, I've worked with CEO teams and there were guys who didn't talk to each other for, I don't know, half a year, year. They really tried to fight all the time. And this didn't has, have to do with the content. It, it was more power game because people had the feeling that they're not appreciated, that they're not seen by what they're contributing. And so what it's, it's, hinders them to talk to each other? Well, I think a lot of people never learned that this is an option, how to how to handle conflicts. You know, very often we say soft factors, but what I learned is that the soft is really the hard stuff, you know, and it's easy to talk about numbers and figures and analysis, but it's very hard to talk about feelings, emotions, and not just the friendly emotions, you know, the ones we like, like, uh, I'm happy, I'm in good mood, but actually that I'm aggressive now, you know, you irritate me, you know, there's something I don't appreciate at all. And this is something I think we have to learn that all emotions are our friends, what I usually say, and to um, get in touch with them and then share them in an appropriate manner. You work with different cultures mm. globally. Do you do you see differences in uh, handling emotions and yeah. some taboos on some emotions and others? Yeah, yeah. I think it it absolutely has to do with the culture, our upbringing, what's more natural and not. I mean, like I, I studied in the U.S. and um, there we think you know it's easy for them to give feedback, but yes, they are maybe more open. They are more more used to giving feedback, but the question is the depth of where we actually touch each other and talk to each other. Um, I've, as I said, I've just started working with this Argentinian software company and uh, there, especially in the Latin American countries, I have the feeling, you know, the heart speaks more often than maybe the mind, which I love because it's a more holistic approach. So of course it depends. I work a lot in the Nordics, you know, and people, are di yes, we are different and uh, it's good that we are different and that we use the diversity to actually bring more to this world. And I think also that nowadays we really have to ensure that we talk to each other because the complexity is increasing. There are questions nowadays we've never had before. So we need actually different minds and hearts to think together, to create together and to come to uh, conclusions together. The heart speaks more beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, I asked once my parents uh, because they had different languages when they met in Rome for the first time very long ago. And I asked him, how did you talk to each other when you met for the first time? Because he was speaking only Italian and she only German. And my mother said, you know, Simon, I was a little kid. And she said, you know, Simon, sometimes the heart speaks more than yeah. the words. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we forgot it. We forget it sometimes. Mm. But this is every human being wants to be seen, whether it's in a business context or a private context yeah